All right, welcome everyone. This is Dallas McLean with Biohackers Update. I'm here with Patrick Houston. He is an Olympic world champion athlete of archery and he does archery, archery and more archery and he took time out of his schedule today to be with us. So we appreciate that. Patrick, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to, great to be part of Like I've been a, an enthusiastic biohacker myself for probably pushing a year or so now. Um, um, like I said, I've learned a lot, I've definitely improved myself, and changed my own life an awful lot from it. And it's, uh, it's just awesome to be, to be able to sort of share my own experiences, my own story with, you know, people that are as passionate about the same weird and wacky things that I do. <laughs> well, hey, welcome to the club, man. Uh, I, I know that there's a spiritual class of biohackers that um, love to talk about these type of things and, and share what helped make them grow. And Speaking a little bit more about your history, um, I know you you're an archery man, but at what when at what point did you kind of get involved with biohacking in your archery career? Was it early on or later? Um, so it, it's definitely come later in my career. Um, I became a full time archer whenever I left school. I planned to go to university. I'd been accepted into Edinburgh University to do economics and finance. But um, I was always going to have a gap year. Took a gap year um, out, uh, out between school and university. Ended up becoming British number one, set a world record. So I thought, you know what? I'll stay. I'll stay with it for another year. See if I can get to the 2016 Olympics. I got to the 2016 Olympics, first British archer to qualify. Um, really, really pleased with that. It was a fantastic achievement. And then basically, I, I loved the life of being a professional athlete. So I stuck with that um, all the way through. And since then qualified for Tokyo, loads of other medals. It's been a really, really good, uh, really good experience. My introduction to biohacking came basically because I got Lyme disease. Um, oh. I was out in a, a marsh, two minutes walk from my house, um, and I was sat down in the grass for a couple of hours and came back with a pile of these bites that I didn't quite get what they were. Mm. And then it turned out I got them, I, 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 there was a pile of tick bites. I got the Lyme, the Lyme uh, neuroborealis. I managed to avoid most of the physical symptoms in terms of sort of body ache, stuff like that. But my body is generally very healthy. You know, I'm, 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 I'm an Olympic athlete. I'd like to say I was able to push that stuff out fairly well. But I managed to get a good number of them. Um, a good number, about actually had eight in total. I must have basically sat in the pig nest. Yeah. Um, but it got into my nervous system, which is not really what you want in Lyme disease. Some people know about it, some people don't. It can do everything from causing you to have some sort of aches and fever and chills, right up to like paralysis and death. Like it, it basically can do pretty much anything because it gets into your nervous system and just goes haywire. And um, so that happened uh, just after the European Games last year. The World Champs European Games qualified for Tokyo at the Worlds and then got a silver medal in the mixed team at the European Games, came home, and then and then this happened. So obviously the rest of my season was written off, um, and I needed to rest quite a lot. I spent a lot of time. I'd already done a lot of research and interest and stuff. I'd never done any formal education in sport, apart from my own sport career, and um, looking into YouTube videos and you know, men's health magazine articles about, you know, weightlifting and various things. Because obviously I want to know more about my, my sport and the effects of things that I'm doing to myself. Um, obviously a lot more time on my hands. I started looking into more and more sort of human physiology, stretching, different bits of basically human physiology. And then that sort of progressed and progressed and progressed. And I'm not actually... 100% sure when exactly the biohacking thing came in, but I got really interested in breath. And we'll, I'll be talking a lot about breath. Breath work is something that I think is almost slightly missing from the, the biohacking community for, for how big an impact it's had on myself and my own life. I've not seen that much um, in the biohacking world, which I'm obviously I'm enthusiastic to talk about today. Um, but I got into the biohacking, biohacking itself. I was doing it for probably a fair period with all the, the stretching and the different things I was doing and trying to improve myself. And I'd only sort of come under the entire title when I met, uh, not quite sure how exactly I came about it online, but I'm sure we've all heard of Dave Asprey. Yes, of course. <laughs> Dave Asprey is superhuman, the father of biohacking. 
got that book um, after reading a couple of articles online and went, you know what, there's so much more I can do. Um, you know, Bob's your uncle ever since that. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's very, uh, very inspiring story how something so that can be so detrimental leads you to biohacking. We, we've seen that similarity in a lot of different uh, stories, a lot of different experts. It's kind of ironic, too, because Lyme disease, if I'm not mistaken, it can leave a bullseye type rash on your skin. Yeah. And you being an archer, that's kind of funny. Slightly ironic that yeah, you get a bullseye rash. That is the the one the one main symptom, the one most noticeable symptom. So if anybody ever gets any kind of bug bug bite that makes a bullseye rash, go to your doctor ASAP. Like right. that is a seriously important and Lyme is a, a massively misdiagnosed and misunderstood disease, and the awareness is very, very low. If people, if everybody knew that this little bite, because all it is, it's a little, it's, it's a tiny little thing. You get this bullseye rash. You don't always get the bullseye rash, by the way. Um, but you get this bullseye rash. And if you don't do anything, you might not be sick for ages. You might not be sick for three months. But right. if three, six months goes by and the bacteria gets into your body, spreads a bit, and it becomes systemic, like you are screwed. You, you, there is, yeah, treatment can do an awful lot but you are likely to be left with major issues for often the rest of your life. So um, it's very, very important. If you get a bullseye rash, any kind of red ring around a bug bite, go to the doctor ASAP. Right, right. And after the doctor, make sure you get involved in archery because apparently it makes you uh, shoot better and, and make better bullseyes. Exactly. As proof of, of you. Um, well, moving into a little bit more of a, of a, personal perspective um you got involved in archery you were saying uh before biohacking um could you tell me more about how it aligns with your your personal mission your your ultimate goal in life like what is that that thing that you envision yourself bringing to the world not just to biohacking but the world in general yeah the the thing that i really want to do is to bring archery to to the world to to get more and more people involved in the sport it really is it is a sport that anybody of any age can do like i got into archery because i'm not really sporty i'm obviously i've become an awful lot more athletic you know for obvious reasons um over the past while but i'm not really sporty my family's not really sporty but um getting Basically, I find this sport that involved me standing still and repeating the same action time after time. And then I discovered competitions. I could go along to a competition, test my skill, show off that I was better than other people. Um, and that got me really passionate about the sport. I, I developed more and more into it. I found more and more elements of the sport. But the, the thing that is amazing about it is that it is a sport anybody can do from any age or from about five or six, definitely seven or eight, but up until 80, 90, even 100. At the World Masters Championships in Lausanne last year, the oldest competitor was 92. Wow. And he's competitive, like he's competing at, a, at an event. You know, there is actually in Archery GB, there is a spike in membership at retirement age. Because it is a low impact sport that anybody can do. You don't need to be strong. You don't need to be fit. You don't need to have good coordination. At the London Olympics, the guy that set, he set a world record in the qualifying round, he's not allowed to drive. His eyesight is that bad. He's basically legally blind. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're able to do. It's a sport that has so many different elements and so many different ways to enjoy it, so many ways to go out and participate. You can shoot target archery like I do, like a golf driving range, or you can go out and do a golf course, which is field archery. You can shoot 3D targets, which is simulating hunting. In the, in the States, you've got bow hunting, which is absolutely enormous. There's a type of archery called clout, where you're shooting up in the air at a target 180 yards away on the floor. So that's practicing to shoot French people. There are <laughs> dozens of different bow styles. You can color coordinate everything. Like it really is one of the most widely enjoyable sports. You know, there is no segment of the population that can't enjoy archery. You know, a twenty-something that's looking for a, a social activity and something to take up some weekends and evenings, fantastic for you. A fifty-year-old that the kids have left, kids have flown the nest, and they've got uh, they've got no time and they want to go and 
spend some money on some cute equipment and, or some cool equipment to tinker with stuff, fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, an, an old bloke in his 70s that's, um, you know, sat around wondering what to do, he can go down on a Tuesday, Wednesday morning with his longbow, shoot some arrows with other people. It really can be enjoyed by anybody. There's actually a fantastic little, um, fantastic fact that because of both the Hunger Games and Brave, um, we have a really, really strong junior girls population coming into the sport. At our British Indoor Championships, the biggest categories in the junior events were the under 14 and under 12 junior girls. How many sports have that as a, as a, as a fact? You know, that we've, been, yeah. we've got a bigger junior women population. Like, that is a fantastic opportunity. And basically, I want to do my best to promote the sport using various different mechanisms, um, but to promote the sport and get people into it because everybody can enjoy it and everybody can get something out of it. You know, those are great points, I think, Patrick. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that there's sports out there like this that can be fun and, and enjoyed by all ages that are low impact, you know, not just a certain older population or younger population. Um, for example, I played tennis, and, and although that's not like you bump into people, it, it wears, it's wear and tear on your body, man. I mean, your hips, my grandfather played for a long time, and he's got two hip replacements, you know. And archery is just, it's just one motion, and you're having fun at the same time. Um, and, you know, of course, establishing those connections with the people that you're playing with and everything, as, that's as important as, as having a really, fun. really strong social element to it, a really strong social element because of the, just the way it often works, where you go up to the line, you shoot, you come back, other people go up and shoot. You know, you're there as a club. There's an awful lot of people that stay, that stop shooting, but stay in the sport because they really enjoy just the social element because you're going along to do this activity that, you know, you're actually doing the, the shooting itself. You're actually doing archery for maybe 15, 20% of the time you're there. And yeah. um, just with walking up to the target, collecting your arrows, coming back, etc. So there's loads of time to develop social bonds. And because of the, the nature of the breadth of the sport, um, you've got people of all ages and friendships um, spanning all age groups, which is just lovely and a really, really wholesome thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. That's a great thing. Anything that brings people together, I think, is is a good sport in my book. Um, going back to your history, you've been doing archery for a long time, you said. Um, now, we know that how safe the sport is and how timeless it is and everything. Are there certain injuries that are associated with archery in certain terms? Maybe, I know, like, in tennis, for example, you get tennis elbow or something if you do the motion so many times. Um, and how how is the best way to go about, you know, treating that and healing that from and more of a biohacking method um well the most um the most likely issue for you to have is um impingements in your shoulders and um, if you imagine the general motion that people think of for archery people generally think it's all very arm based but it is um it's massively in the shoulder blades you can see in my back there the amount of movement in my shoulder blades mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's all in those muscles and it's all coming through uh, coming through the deltoids, coming into the scapula and the shoulder blades, rhomboids, trapezius, lats, etc. And um, with bad technique, it's very easy for impingement in here to happen. You know, you've got your clavicle, you've got your paracord process, your chromium process, the head of the humerus. There's an awful lot of stuff here. Like it's a very, very, um, very intense joint. That's why people get frozen shoulder because there's so many things there. But particularly if the fascia are coming up and connecting. We'll get on to fascia. Fascia is a very important uh, thing, which is totally missed out. Literally, it's not in biology books. It's literally ignored. Um, anyway, it's moving the right way. It's slowly becoming known about. Um, but this stuff gets frozen because of the amount of stuff going on in there. If you draw the bow and you have the wrong tension, if you have the wrong muscle pulling the bow, it's very easy for issues to get um, to get lodged in your shoulder and impingements and things to get irritated. It's not necessarily frequent i would say maybe one in 50 archers suffers with it you know it wouldn't be a large amount of, uh, wouldn't be a large amount really at all and um, you can't end up with sort of neck issues that's if you specifically have um you specifically have very very bad sort of forward head posture and bad kyphotic spine and then trying to pull a hard uh, a strong bow can end up with issues there but arguably if you're in that 
state and you go and do anything beyond your physical um, level of strain, you're going to end up with issues. In terms of getting around it, the best way to do it is to learn it correctly, which doesn't really help the people that have already learned it. Um, but I have some particular viewpoints on how to teach people the, just the basic fundamentals. The first time they come into the sport and um, they just need it taught literally a few different words. There's a, they say the first time you pick up a bow is pull the string to your face and you pull the string into your face. The thing is that as you do that, you activate all your hand to pull it into your face. And then over a period of time, you get taught, no, it's meant to be your back, not your hand and your arm. So you pull your back round, you pull your elbow round, you get what's called back tension. Um, and this lodges all around that way. But this ends up being really tight. You get your bicep tight, your pec minors are tight. And then that's fighting all the stuff there, hence back tension. Mm -hmm. If you learn to shoot with two fingers to begin with, then when you pull back, you can't make two fingers tight the way you can with three. And you, if you don't pull into the face, but say use your f two fingers and put the elbow behind you, you put the elbow behind you, your hand is going to be in the right place. But there's a big difference between pull the string to your face and put the elbow behind you. But anyway, that's getting on to the technicalities of our no, okay. I believe in that so much that this tattoo is literally here for exactly that reason. This little black stripe here is because if you pull it into your face, this, um, this bone in your arm gets tucked in underneath, and I want people to have a rolled over wrist, mm -hmm. which involves the relaxation on the wrist rolling over, which this tattoo highlights that point. So wow. I'm glad that I have tattooed on myself. Neat, neat. Even an expert has to be reminded, right? You know, uh, that's a, that's a good way to do it. Other people. Right, yeah, yeah, very cool. Uh, I, I wanted to get back into the, um, a little bit of the, the things that you told me that you, you like to do in, in terms of biohacking that, that could also help your archery game. Uh, you sent me a list a little earlier and I'll, I'll just go over some of them. Um, you said collagen every day, including XCT, um, barefoot shoes, for example, dark chocolate for, for 10 reduction. Um, one of the biggest ones you touched on and, and you mentioned a little earlier was nasal breathing. Uh, saying it was probably the biggest thing for you and, and you tape your mouth to sleep. Now, I know about nasal breathing and, and running and, and trying to exercise and breathe through your nose and stuff, but I've never heard of this taping the mouth to sleep. Could you expand a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, so your body is designed to breathe to breathe through the nose. The nose is connected to the diaphragm. And if you breathe through the nose, you're much more likely to breathe fuller into your lungs and have much more functional, um, much more functional usage of your lungs particularly because the, um, the high quality blood and the high, high density blood vessels are lower in your lungs. So if you breathe through your nose, your diaphragm pulls the air low into the blood, into the lungs, and then the lungs end up absorbing it better. You're also more likely to breathe slower. And interestingly, there's called the Bohr curve, B-O-H-R, and the Bohr dissociation curve, whereby if you have too little, we think of carbon dioxide as a bad gas, as a waste gas, with too little carbon dioxide, i.e. breathing too much, you end up breathing out all the carbon dioxide, and the hemoglobin, the, the red blood cells, don't let go of the uh, don't let go of the oxygen. So we actually need a higher level of carbon dioxide than pretty much anybody has in their blood, and you can very very easily bring yourself to um to to do to to fix to fix that. Um, basically, it's the carbon dioxide meter, the monitor, which says there's too much carbon dioxide I need to breathe. So if you go in for a walk, just take a breath in, take a breath out, and hold your breath and see how far you can walk. Count the number of steps. If you've not done it before, you'll get between sort of 15 and 30. I'd be impressed if anybody, even pushing it, can get much further than that because alarm bells are going off saying, I need to breathe really, really hard. And um, you do that three or four times a few days in a row, you'll find you can get up to 50, 60 steps. And that's not because of a physiological change. That's just because that meter in your brain has said, I can, I can last that long, that long. I can function with this much carbon dioxide in your, in your body. So if you breathe through your mouth all the time, you end up with your entire body being depleted of oxygen and therefore depleted of energy. And it's particularly prevalent when you're asleep. Um, if you're asleep and you breathe through your mouth, simple way to check it is do you wake up and feel the need of a glass of water instantly? If you need a glass of water as soon as you wake up, you've probably been breathing through your mouth all night. Um, so you tape up your mouth and that makes you, I use, uh, what's here is like, oh, I'm using something else. This is just micropore, just 3M micropore, nothing fancy at all. Um, just put it across my mouth 
and that means that I breathe through my, my, my nose all night. There are a variety of studies. Patrick McKeown from the Oxygen Advantage strongly recommend the book, um, and a fantastic YouTube channel as well. Um, he, he cites a variety of studies that show that breathing through your mouth at rest and in sleep can actually cause the symptoms and effects of ADHD, which like that is huge. Wow. You know, how many kids are on Ritalin um, and all these other drugs these days to make them focus better in school? But if we just taught them, close your mouth, you know, while you're sat there at work, do you imagine we we have the fight or flight response? Everybody knows about your your uh, adrenal glands, the fight or flight response. And um, when we are chasing down a rhino or being you know, attacked by, by something, they're falling out of a tree, whatever it is that's making our body go into that state, we then open our mouth to breathe more air because we need to get large quantities of air in to facilitate the exertion that we're doing. But you can, re, you, you can backwire that effectively that if you are breathing through your mouth all the time, you live in a state of fight or flight. Um, and the big thing that I found by training myself to breathe through my nose all the time was I became so much less reactive about things. You know, I was much more calm. I was much more, you know, I, just everything was just more deliberate. And if things were a choice, I didn't make an instantaneous decision. I didn't just react to things. And I was just less stressed. It was, and that, that has massive impacts to inflammation across your body. If you stay in your sympathetic nervous system all the time by breathing through your mouth, because that is what it's, it's there for, <laughs> that is what panting is for, getting over stressful situations. Right. If you just slow down your breath, take a little gap in between. There's another thing called... Um, basically having a gap in between your breath. The potato method is one method for it. Um, intermittent breathing, that's the word. Um, so basically taking a breath in through your nose, out through your nose, little break, little gap, maybe five, six seconds, and then another breath. You do 10 of them, you are so much calmer, like so much calmer. It's amazing how quickly you can change your, your state of, of existence and your state of being um, just, by, just by that. And I've noticed myself that since I started taping up my mouth, I make less silly errors. I'm more, more aware and more alert and more rested. I wake up, you know the way, like, particularly if you've got some of the environmental toxins and issues going on in your life so that you don't rest well, you can wake up feeling like you're humble. You wake up feeling crap. You wake up not feeling well rested. But if your body's there going... The entire night, which is what an awful lot of people are, you're mm. never going to wake up with your body having gone into rest and digest, and therefore you wake up unrested. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's you went really deep into a lot of the the physiological processes there. That's really interesting. Um, I think that's a very important thing that people need to learn to do because, especially in today's society where everything's move, move, move during the day, we need that rest at night. You know, and and. Breathing through the nose is a great way to, to, to center ourselves, I think. Um, and a lot of yoga techniques and yoga moves and everything they do, the yoga through the, through the nose and, and all that, teaching that. So that, I think that's really important. Um, going back to one of these other things that you had on the list here, and, and maybe, maybe I'm looking at it wrong, but you said you spent $150 on, on new underwear because you, you'd held your stomach in for years and, and you have to invest in new trousers because you have four pairs that actually fit. Uh, so yeah. I'm not sure if this is a biohack or this is just you sharing some cool, like random fact with me or what, but I uh, wanted to ask you what It is all fundamentally connected. Um, and absolutely, absolutely connected. I would recommend anybody has a look at Elliot Hulse on YouTube. Um, as you may guess, as I go through all of this, YouTube has been one of my major learning sources. Um, I'm very, very good at just listening to things and the information being absorbed. So I've got a variety of sources that I've listened to and absorbed the information from, um, from YouTube. Um, so holding your stomach in is a counterpulsation to breathing. When you breathe, your diaphragm needs to expand. Um, and your diaphragm expands downwards and outwards. And um, one of the other things in breath work that nobody ever talks about is that your side ribs should expand. Your diaphragm doesn't. A lot of people know about belly breathing, about diaphragmatic breathing down here. Some people don't, and that's something they need to learn. But um, often people don't know that actually your diaphragm, it's like an umbrella, an umbrella flattening down. So if you put your hands on your side ribs there, they should expand out as you do that. You probably don't, and particularly anybody with any form of forward head posture, kyphotic spine, these ribs get, get locked down. So we end up breathing in the upper chest, the scalenes in here, 
extra respiratory muscles, they become really tight. You end up living like that. If you imagine those muscles, thernocleid and mastoid there and your scalenes all get tight. Mm. Anyway, um, your diaphragm needs to expand downwards to let your lungs and um, let your lungs expand and let yourself breathe. And for the obvious reasons of personal body image, most people train themselves to hold their stomach in. And it's actually particularly rel um, poignant for larger people. You often see a, a, large, a large man, they'll have the belly, but there will be a band, and you can actually see it, you can often see it like it often sits over the, over the belt, where the bulge sits over the belt, there's a band directly below it. And that is a line of tension which is fundamentally built into their body from years of, of holding their belly in. Mm. And basically, particularly through my sport and the amount of tension that I create in my body, you know, it's all, it's all the sort of rotational stuff here. I started developing, particularly in major tournaments, really, really deep belly aches and pain across literally just inside here. And at times I've, I've been to hospital for it before. This, before the selection shoot for Rio 2016, I went to hospital because I, I thought I had appendicitis. That's as far as it went. Wow. Um, and that was due to the amount of tension in there. From years of basically my entire life, I'd held, um, held my stomach in. And it's particularly a thing when most people, an awful lot of people have this chest on posture, forward head posture. I'm, I'm exaggerating it, but you will see people with this neck here, um, the, the back rounded, shoulders protracted forwards. But as you do this, this tummy comes out more. So if I pull, pull my shirt tight, you know, there's my stomach sort of kind of relaxed. I'm talking all the time, so my, my stomach's all a little bit more tense now than it should be. But um, if I stand there, I've got not much of a tummy, but there's a bit of a protrusion. If I now collapse my ribs, suddenly this becomes noticeably more protruded in front of you. And it actually gets exacerbated by the fact that from this perspective, looking down, it looks a lot worse from your own viewpoint. Mm. That looks like you have a huge belly and then you suck it in. I was a 24 year old athlete, 24 year old Olympian, being a professional archer for six years. I was still wearing the same size trousers I was when I was 17. Wow. And that's because I have a lot of muscle there and I could just contract it and hold it in. And it literally, by the tension that you, cr you create somewhere, gets transferred everywhere else. There's a very, very strong relationship between the mind and the body. It's this concept called bioenergetics that is. It comes in, I believe it very much comes into biohacking, but basically by limiting yourself somewhere, you cause ripple effects across the rest of your body. By holding this in here, you are literally creating a fake existence that is created through tension. Um, by that tension, you are limiting your own psychology. Now, that's a very, very shortened version of the entire process of it, but basically allowing your stomach to actually relax and allowing yourself to actually sit in the, the correct position of your organs, your body functions better and your mind becomes freer. I talk about freeing yourself from your bioenergetic shackles. There's, I, like, I, I have more of it because I'm an Olympic athlete, what I've done to my body to make the amount of tension I hold at full draw becomes tighter. So all of it is, is increased. You know, for me, it's taken a long time to try, try and actually relax it. And it well, I could do it straight away. I went from a size, a 32 inch waist to a 36 inch waist in four days. Wow. And there's food that I could wear then. And that's not because I instantly got fat, but it's because I stopped holding my stomach. Yeah. I still end up holding my stomach because it's so much built into me. But um, regular humans that aren't Olympians should be able to do this stuff a lot easier. But you may think I'm going to look fat. You don't look fat if you work on your chest as well. Something I would recommend to get over that is uh, known as a bioenergetic stool. This is just, a, just any old bar stool. It's actually a, a Hoyt, Hoyt archery stool from my, um, my sponsors. And this is a foam roller. Um, and it's literally just held on, held on the top by an elastic band. And this allows you to, to, stretch, your, to stretch your back. I don't know quite how much. Yeah, you can see me. Yeah, I can see you. <sighs> Yeah. And that instantly starts flexing your spine against that uh, kyphotic sort of chest down posture. And that, like, you can do that 
and within 10 seconds you feel this tension in your body and it'll vibrate and you breathe you open your mouth really wide this is one time you should mouth breathe you open your mouth really wide and you breathe through it and the stuff the, the tissue inside your body relaxes and opens up and then you end up feeling feeling better if you imagine somebody crying they clap down like that if you imagine someone frightened they pull in like that if you imagine someone angry they stick their neck forward these are all emotions which become charles darwin in his book uh, the expression of emotions in human beings and animals he talks about emotions being a physical result of an uh, emotively charged nervous system there are physical states that we physically take on because of our emotions mm. but that then backwires of if we take on those states we take on those emotions if i'm crying i come down like this but that also means if because of being sat in a chair that's bad for my posture never paying attention to it and see you sitting up more straight <laughs> <laughs> if we for whatever reason then allow ourselves to come into this position all the time because our tissue is in this shape it sends the message to our body that we're sad that we're depressed that we're down and as much as you might try and get over that mentally it's why i'm um, talking therapies never have really done any any great obviously it does help people but it's a very slow process to get to to improve and an awful lot of people how many people are on antidepressants nowadays frightening numbers mm -hmm. that kind of suggest the medication and stuff doesn't work if we told somebody that actually don't you know everybody knows the idea that if you put your head down you know you're down you lift your head up you feel slightly better that is the same for you true for your entire body and if you break yourself free of it it takes a period of time takes a period of time for your body and your tissues to adapt to change but if you put yourself if you make sure you know i'm feeling crap i'm feeling really low i'm feeling really depressed okay let's just make sure i don't look like that and if you you know stretch your back a bit open yourself out put a couple of pillows down open your body up that way stretch your sternocleidomastoids these muscles here mm -hmm. rotate your neck so that your head isn't stuck like this you will start feeling better because your body isn't telling your brain you're low right fake it, you, fake it till you make it kind of you know um i read in a book one time the the power of just making yourself smile can do so much that uh, if people don't know what that is What's so that? this muscle here yeah that's called your platysma muscle pl p-l-a-t-y-s-m-a -A. um if you you know, if I, you know, the turn your frown upside down, if you frown really hard. Yeah, you can feel it. Here. That actually the set of muscle. The platysma muscle, it's a very, very superficial muscle in your body, but it attaches into the corners of your mouth and goes across down literally all of this. You know, the, the sort of turkey neck you see old people with? Mm -hmm. um, that's the platysma muscle. It goes, mine is very developed because of obviously what I do, which kind of makes it all really obvious, but. If you imagine getting really angry, and I've noticed it myself, you know, sometimes I'll be looking at things on, on social media and getting angry and I can feel <laughs> all the food start tightening up. If we let that tension develop consistently, we end up stuck in that emotion. This, mo this, this muscle is used to express emotions. If we are sad, you know, you end up in that shape. And that is that. The pressure on the sides of your mouth coming down this direction. Like I actually have, it's, it's an interesting fact, I have some of these, um, quite a few spots here at the moment, and that's because as you remove these fascial adhesions, as you loosen up your body, the body releases toxins from it. Um, and basically anywhere that I work on to try and release the tension inside the tissue inside, um, it ends up basically letting the toxins out and you get, like I've got far more spots than a 24 year old should have around here. And that's because I've been literally, I'll grab that, I'll, I'll, I'll grab the corner of my mouth, pull it up, and pull your mouth. And this is a really strange one that, like, in terms of like you know, cures for depression or what have you, um, you can do that and feel happier instantly. I mean, instantly. If you grab, go inside your mouth, grab the corner of your mouth, and pull it up and massage the sides of your cheeks down and just pull it up. Literally, the concept of turning that frown upside down, if you actually try to do that to the tissue, you will feel happier straight away. It's really quite impressive. Wow. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah. And it's cool how you talk about how holding that stress and holding all that focus in one muscle can affect so much more 
down the line, you may not feel it right away, but uh, everything affects everything. So I, I mean, that goes back to that that whole that whole ideology of nothing that happens is not going to be seen anywhere else. So very interesting, very interesting. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you, Patrick, uh, one thing about um, you know someone you look up to, someone you may um, have have a relationship with that maybe helps get you in your game, get you in your focus. And I know you said you, you read Dave Asprey, you read a lot of other books. Um, do you have like a favorite, a favorite author or a favorite person that inspires you? Someone that you'd like to, to share um, in this recording? Not instantaneously off the top of my head, but what I would probably go for is um, the book with winning in mind. So this book was written by Lanny Basham, um, and it's basically my performance Bible. Um, it teaches you about the, controlling the, the language in which you speak about your performance. It, um, it enables you to define the way you see yourself. It enables you to improve or change your self-image. He breaks it down really, really simply that you've got your self-image, your subconscious, and your conscious. And the high level performance comes when the three, the three states are, are balanced. Danny was a uh, Olympic rifle shooter back in the 70s, 70s and 80s. He was, should have won gold in 1972, fluffed it because of the pressure, came back in 1976, having interviewed world champions and world record holders and titans of business, developed his mental management system, as he, as he calls it, came back in 1976, won the, uh, the Olympic title there. He set something like 12 world records, won the world champs either side, loads of other international gold medals. Wow. And has since then taught this uh, manage, mental management system to, um, to huge numbers of athletes in a variety of different sports. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. It's really simple. It's really, really plain, really down to earth. It's not biohacking in the slightest, but you know, biohacking all comes from the basis of your mind. Mm -hmm. And if you make definitions and if you make directive affirmations, as he talks about, um, and structure your, your thoughts in a particular direction, it makes sure that it basically makes the, the probability of a performance under pressure far higher. Oh. I strongly recommend that book. It's about maybe $18 on Amazon. Okay. It's not much. Yeah. And it really, really simply as well. He wrote it back in, back in the, I think, the early 80s. Um, and basically, it was one of the first um, performance sports psychology books. But he's not a psychologist. So he just wrote it. He didn't have to, everybody, every sports psychologist nowadays has to turn things into their own model and explain things in a specific way and use different bits of language. He was one of the first. So he used English really, really quite easy. Wow. Yeah. I mean, the, the power of affirmations, uh, you know, from some books I've read, like, like Think and Grow Rich, The Magic of Believing by Claude Bristol, all these types of books that, that are actually very funny, um, written in an older time, um, I think they all have that message that correlates with, with the winning in mind. You know, you have a winning mindset. You have these affirmations that you constantly repeat to yourself and everything. Um, it make it makes a big difference, uh, like you said. I mean, power. it's simple things like not um, not allowing people to speak negatively about your performance, or not listening to people speak negatively about their performance. Mm -hmm. You know, I know friends that say, "Oh, I've, I've shot uh, I've shot six ninety five four times." But you'll talk about the time you shot 680. Whereas now I've trained him that he now says, I've shot 700 six out of the past eight times. So that's that because he's spoken about it, that makes it more likely to happen. The more you talk about, think about, and write about something, the more likely it is to happen. For example, I've got four gold medals up behind here. These two here, these two square ones, they're from the World, World Youth Championships. I won an individual on a mixed team gold that day, double gold medalist. Um, this is the world ranking event in Slovenia back in 2017. I won the individual mixed team event that day, double gold medalist. Every time I see those medals, particularly every time I mention it in interviews, um, every time I see those medals, it makes it more like me, more likely for me to be a double gold medalist again. So it's all about the power of reinforcement and the small ways you can, the small ways you can add it into your life. Really, really good book. Yeah, yeah, it sounds super interesting, man. Um, and I wanted to to talk a little bit about um, some of the biohacks that you you mentioned earlier. Uh, if you could tell someone, if you had like five minutes to sit down with someone at a coffee table and look, I think you should do this. This is going to make your life so much better. 
what would be the one hack, the one biohack that you would share with them? <laughs> Red light, the glasses. Yeah. Red light glasses. Um, as you can see behind me, I've got my LEDs up in the bedroom, uh -huh. and that means that come, you know, eight nine p.m. If I'm downstairs and I'm not in my bedroom, the glasses go on, and if I'm in my bedroom, then the um, then the, the LEDs go red. They're on some kind of orange thing at the moment. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to see what looked good for the video, um, so I make sure that I always have always have them on because the difference in my quality of sleep since I took blue light out of my life in the evenings is absolutely enormous. Yeah. Um, I've also got a red light over there, um, which I find very useful for yes, just to improve my skin and stuff like that. It's not quite big enough to get all of me, and I don't necessarily devote enough enough time to it to, to get the uh, the worth. But um, that's going to be probably the biggest one. And the next one is going to be foot flexibility. Mm. So um, in terms of books, actually, Barefoot Strong by Emily Splickle. And she is probably, in terms of biohacking, she is probably one of the best ones. Biohacking from a really physiological standpoint, she is probably one of the people I've learned the most from. Um, she's got a fantastic YouTube channel, EBFA, Education Evidence-Based Fitness Academy. Um, she's got, it's just absolutely fantastic. You, you can literally learn everything you need to know from about anything physiological from her, about how to reset your vagus nerve, how to control your, your physiology. She talks about grounding. I've got a grounding sheet on my bed now, an earthing sheet, so that I'm plugged into the earth every night. Um, but Barefoot Strong is about um, getting your feet mobilized. Nowadays, we live in, people live in what I call little coffins. Um, our feet are designed to be wild. They're designed to be free. They're designed to be mobile. And we have them now wrapped up in these plastic foam leather hard things so that our feet are not the shape they should be and my my shoes i use the vivo barefoot and my my shoes that is the shape of a foot and that means that my foot can be the shape of i'll send you some photographs so i've got what my feet used to be like and then what my feet are like now this is another tool i use it's called the blackboard so basically it pivots in multiple planes so you can do different different things with it and mobilize your feet in different ways so basically your big toe isn't meant to be shoved up beside the other ones it's a hand it's meant to have a gap between it and basically our shoes nowadays are not designed to do that and the entire concept of jogging is functionally incorrect human beings wouldn't ever jog if we didn't put a massive pile of foam underneath our shoes some ridiculous portion of runners get injured every year it's something like 75 80 percent you know, that is a huge number. And given that humans are born to run and we develop gluteus muscles for the sake of running, you know, we, we sweat rather than pant. We can chase down massive mammals and prey because we can run. So why do, you, why do people get injured all the time? They get injured because they wear shoes with big padding underneath the heels. And they heel strike when they run and our body isn't designed to do that. If you land on your forefoot or the balls of your feet, then your body stores that elastic energy and you actually become far more efficient, you can run further, and you're more effective. You also don't get injured. So um, mobilize your feet. I also made this myself. This is a balance beam. It's literally just a piece of wood with, um, with two pieces of wood at the end. Um, I just stand on it and try and balance. Fantastic for mobilizing your feet. You would be amazed what a small amount of massage on your feet can do. A way of, um, a way of proving it to yourself this is just a spiky ball I use to massage myself. You can use a cricket ball, a tennis ball, you know, whatever, a lacrosse ball. The cross ball is a little bit soft, but um, if you put that on the floor and roll, your, first off, bend down, see how far you can reach down towards the floor, and then roll your feet on top of it. Instantly, you'll be able to reach further, and that shows how connected your entire body is. You know, old people are a massive fall risk, and that's because they've spent their entire life with their disconnected to the to the disconnect from the earth so they end up walking around basically with hooves and we're meant to have a functional a functional set of biology that connects all the way down so um barefoot strong uh get your feet out loosen up your big toes mobilize your body and uh, eat loads of collagen nice nice very cool good advice i'm definitely going to start trying the the foot um the foot i'll send you a pile of things to look at yeah yeah please <laughs> Uh, my foot function, uh, the foot collective, and uh, EBFA, Dr. Emily Splickle.
Okay, cool, man. Yeah, I'll definitely check it out. Um, the last thing I wanted to ask you, Patrick, uh, before we run out of time here is that, um, with everything going on in the world and the lockdowns and the pandemic and people being shut up in their houses, a lot of people are finding it hard to, to explore um, what they want to and, and get their, their mind released by seeing other things in the world. But as we both know, a lot of it's in the mind. Um, what would you like to share with people that are kind of going through this pandemic right now? Check out Wim Hof, W-I-M-H-O-F. He's a Dutch guy that does um, some breathing techniques combined with cold showers. I have a cold shower every day as well. And um, I've taught myself to love it because if you, once you get over the perspective that it, the cold is bad, the cold is frightening, it's actually really, really powerful for your, uh, for your circulatory system. You get in the shower, you turn it on cold, you turn it on hot, you swap it backwards and forwards. Your circulatory system expands and contracts and basically you, um, nourishes your body far more effectively. It also pumps up your mitochondria and get, gets a load of really, really powerful benefits in there, as well as it being a fantastic way to cool your mind. Wim Hof teaches you this breath work that basically you get really high off oxygen. And like you get really high off oxygen whilst it's doing a whole host of tremendous physiological impacts. He's done some amazing, amazing feats using his breath work. And he expands, you can expand your neurology into your body simply through the power of your own mind. Check out Wim Hof, W-I-M-H-O-F, and do loads of breath work. And then once you finish that breath work, breathe through your nose. Awesome, cool. Great, great advice, man, for sure. The Wim Hof uh, has definitely has his uh, reputation ahead of him. He's, he's a very powerful guy in the world of biohacking, and I, I think everyone should definitely take the time to check him out. Um, Patrick, hey, listen, it's been a pleasure, man. Um, I've learned a lot. I'm sure everyone watching has learned a lot. And uh, I can't wait to watch you succeed and, and bring back some more gold medals. Cheers, Dallas. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Take care and we'll be in touch.